Okay, here are the notes for the Sandbox Sessions on Meditation for February the 11th, 2015. And um, we've been moving along with two approaches, one looking at aspects of meditation, and so far we have six. And I think I'll hold off at six. We could go and generate more, but uh, from this point on, we'll stay with these six that we have. And what I'm going to do is practice chunking down on one of the six at each of the sessions. So we'll pick one, and I'll drill down, chunk down into specific examples of how that sort of higher level aspect or perspective can roll out. The other thing we've been doing is going through the nine guiding principles, and we have the last one to cover tonight, number nine. And then from that point, we'll do the same with the principles as well. We'll pick one and crunch down. Now, you can learn to crunch up and down, and it's probably a good thing to do. So you can be experiencing something and crunch up and ask the question, what could this be? Uh, related to in terms of one of these higher level aspects where you might even find a new one. So I'm going to pick number two of the aspects, the discussion about our conscious awareness and that aspect of ourselves we call the subconscious. So we have this thing, conscious awareness of our day-to-day -day moments and we call that, you know, being in the present. And we have something that we do on a regular basis that makes us kind of unique in, you know, I think, in the animal world and, and in some cultures. We're very aware of time. Time is the synchronizing component that we use to know where to be, when, when to get out of bed, when to make lunch, when to call someone, uh, when to get to work, when work is done. We use time uh, in our day-to-day -day lives continually. And for us, uh, in our conscious awareness state, we're very aware of the past, and we're aware of the present, of course, and the future. Um, to the subconscious, the subconscious world doesn't really need time. Because the sole purpose of the subconscious is survival, is to keep us functioning, to protect us, to know when to go into the fight or flight response, and when to go into the relaxation response, and a whole bunch of other aspects that, that keep us functional. So the subconscious, or the greater self, doesn't really divide uh, information up into what was past, what was present. And what's in the future. And a good example of that is um, people, if they recall a traumatic event from the past, relive it in the present. And similarly, if you recall something or uh, that you think you're going to be doing in the future, and if it has uh, some tension about it, such as going to the dentist or writing an exam, you'll experience the stress about that future event now. And that's the subconscious responding to any input. The interesting thing is that the, we have the skill of generalizing events uh, in our subconscious and reacting very quickly. And that's a survival thing. So the subconscious can blend previous experiences, what you are observing at this particular moment, and project it into the future and react. And this happens very rapidly. And you could think of a little bunny rabbit hopping along, eating carrot tops, and suddenly dashes off. Well, it didn't sit there and think about it very long. It reacted, its survival instinct kicked in. And we have that same area in, in our mid and lower brain that immediately reacts to anything, any input, present, past, and future. So this is, this is very, very important, but how this relates to meditation 
is that when you start to go down into these lower levels of relaxation, you're not occupying the subconscious with a lot of input. Your eyes are closed most of the time, your eyes are closed, and you're just calming the mind. So the subconscious now has lots of time to do things it can't do when you're high up in beta, busy in your day. So what does the subconscious do when it has free time? Well, it doesn't relax and put its feet up on the, on the chest of him. It looks around and says, oh, now it's time to do host cleaning. So we have something uh, I like to call a timeline that we've constructed that goes back into the past, maybe even before we were born, that includes our history. And our timeline comes up to the present and extends into the future. We construct a possible future. So the subconscious will go along the ti this timeline trying to heal it. And I like to call it cleansing process. And this happens naturally when you meditate. There's a thing called bubbling up. And you might experience this if you sit quietly after you meditate for a period of time. Things will, will come to you, will bubble up from the subconscious. Things you, you need to repair and heal. Um, and so the subconscious will, will automatically uh, lead you towards things for healing. Now, what I really like about this whole idea about the fact that in our aware day-to-day -day conscious world, we have time, but to the subconscious there is no time, that has a huge advantage. If you can access that timeless realm, then you can heal anything whether it be something in the future or something in the past or present and you can comment using the other techniques that we've talked about before. So for the subconscious there is no time, everything is now. And you may have heard the ex expression be here now. Um, well as I said as you move into that uh, subconscious world you will gain the feeling of this ability to move along your timeline and respond to things um, appropriately. Uh, if we have time in maybe the next session, we'll do a little exercise that helps to speed up this healing process, the cleaning process of your timeline. Um, a little exercise uh, where you can consciously assist the subconscious to clean the, the timeline. So in a sense, you have the ability to communicate with your subconscious. Maybe another way I like to put it is that your subconscious is listening and paying attention to everything you focus on. So if you focus on something, you're focusing your time, your entire being, and that includes, of course, your subconscious. Okay, well, let's just leave that there. Um, you know, the, the timeless aspect of the subconscious and how you can access that more freely when you're in a calm meditative state. Um, I'm going to move now to the nine guiding principles and we are at number nine now and uh, this will wrap up the sequence and as I said earlier in future sessions we'll, we'll pick one of the nine and drill down. So I'm not going to go into any of the previous ones. You can go back to the previous notes and uh, get information on those. So, um, the ninth one is called the neutral universe. The neutral universe, number nine. And here's an expression that when I first heard it, uh, gave me a, a little bit of an unsettling feeling. I, I didn't quite go along with it at first until I really thought about it. Here's the expression. The universe is going nowhere for no particular reason. The universe is going nowhere for no particular reason. Um, this gives the, um, the, the impression that we like to believe that there's meaning in everything and we seek meaning. And in the meditation practices and some of the ancient writings, 
They like to divide the uh, experience of now into two uh, aspects. One is the mind and the other is reality. So our mind, when we look at something, we're going to assign a meaning to it. So we look at a chair, a chair is a chair, we look at a car, a car is a car. But if you just look at uh, nature um, without man-made objects in it, it may appear to be kind of meaningless. And so, um, again, as a survival technique in our subconscious, it's really important to be identify, to be able to identify danger, to be able to identify food. So we begin classifying. So the, our conscious mind classifies, identifies, uh, puts labels on things. But these labels are man are man made. So he, here's another expression of how the mind, uh, the view of the world is not necessarily reality. We, we assign meaning to everything we see in the universe in our experience. And you, you can use this uh, expression, nothing has any meaning except what we give it. We assign meaning to what we are perceiving. There's also, uh, I believe this comes from the school of Zen, where Zen were the uh, meditation instructor would say to the students, would ask this question, does a tree fall if there is no one there to see it? Does a tree in the forest really fall if there's no one there to see it fall? And that gives me the, the same sensation that I, th I think current science investigation is, is pondering the aspect of the measuring effect you know, they go deeper and deeper into the subparticles of the atom. And I remember one scientist in a documentary I was watching about the, the large-scale collider in Europe. And he says, we get right down to these small and smaller particles, and they have no substance. And now the great debate is, again, following the lines of the three possibilities. Most of the time, these particles are in an undefined state. They're not in any particular place. And it's only when the scientist observes them that he sees them at any one spot. But really, they're, they're not in any one particular location. They're in a sort of range of locations. So our mind is very powerful. So when we're observing something, to bring this up to sort of a more day-to-day -day practical example, when you observe something, um, you assign meaning to it. It might not be the correct meaning. And this is something I find with myself. I try to watch out when I am observing something, having an experience, and I come to a conclusion. Quite often, I'll just say to myself, well, what else could it be? And just open up the possibilities that maybe I came to a conclusion. It might not be right. could be right. But there's always the possibility that it's not. So the meditating person or the meditator's mind can be called the open neutral mind. So when you're sitting quietly observing yourself, just observing, doing your silent meditation, you are doing that not judging what you're experiencing in any particular way and you might be tempted to say oh what you're experiencing is bad oh what I'm experiencing is good um, you could instead of labeling what you are experiencing as good or bad you could label it neutral and just be giving a neutral experience Here's another way of looking at this. I often think of ages, thousands of years ago, when maybe the early thinkers about meditation reality may have been sitting around the fire at night after a long day in the field, and one may have turned to the other and said, Hey, I wonder, what is this that we are experiencing? What is this that we are observing? 
what is this? And you can look out into the stars, and you can look around you. And what I find really interesting is as we gain the ability to look further out into the universe, and we have the ability to look down into the smaller subparticle world, it becomes more mysterious. And things begin, our laws tend to break down. So, you might also look at it this way, that as you practice your meditation, you will begin to see the world without filters. So think of the mind as a filter that's going to classify and organize things based on your internal uh, map. Um, you probably have heard of this, the seven veils, or maybe this expression, seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. And I remember as a kid uh, hearing this description out of the Bible about uh, when you were a child, you saw things as a child, but as you got older, you took off the, the, the glasses that were colored. You saw the world without the colored glasses. Um, another way of looking at this, you may have heard this in some of the other literatures, uh, if you've been reading and researching. Sometimes it's described as looking at the moon from a reflection in the water. We're not really looking at the moon, we're looking in the reflection of it. So if you're viewing the world uh, through the mind's eye, you're viewing it through uh, glasses, through those filters, special filter glasses called you. And I have my own called Steve. Um, through meditating and doing this kind of work, you know, reading, discussing, you will become better at looking at the world without interfering with a neutral mind, understanding that the electron that goes around an atom uh, is not doing it to please us, is not doing it for any particular reason, it's just doing it. Um, now I'm not saying this in, t in an attempt to try to challenge any uh, religious beliefs or anything, it's another way of considering the possibility. If you have beliefs about uh, the purpose of the universe, yes, please keep them. This is not to, intended to challenge it. But perhaps if you think about the universe without the human mind looking at it, it just is. And it would it would be here if we weren't here. Um, I believe, well, that's, that's, that could be debatable too. But anyway, the neutral universe uh, is the last uh, guiding principle and maybe a nice way to use this is a, a place to go to when you want to view the world without your glasses. You can always put the glasses back on, and, and I think we probably do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it could be a real value to look at the universe without the mind, and what do you see? You see an infinite array of possibilities. And I guess that's really the key to be able to open up the vast array of possibilities that you have inside and outside. The best, well, one of the better ways of doing it is to look at the world with a neutral, open mind. Okay, we'll leave that there. And uh, next session, we'll chunk down, drill down one of the six aspects, and we'll also chunk down in one of the nine guiding principles, and perhaps we'll do a little meditation on the timeline. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next session.